Hello, good evening. Welcome back to my IVF Census and European Protein Society. We are back with one more topic today. And as you can see, we have another special guest that joined us today. And it's very, I'm very happy to have you, Dr. Christina, you. here. It's your first webinar on our My IVF Census platform. So I'm really excited to have you here. And I'm sure you are ready to discuss our topic, which is fertility preservation, egg freezing, social freezing as well, what is it called? And of course, you are here to introduce our topic to our audience. And I know that lots of you are waiting for your opportunity to ask the questions. Dr. Christina, welcome. How are you feeling? Yeah. Hope everything is fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. So we can start. Thank you so much indeed for joining. Uh, before we still, uh, sorry, before we start, let me just remind everyone that, uh, as I've mentioned, we will start with a presentation on egg freezing. And Dr. Christina Fukvalova, sorry if I said it uh, incorrectly, uh, but let me just remind everyone that she's the head physician at Ginnem Fertility Clinic in uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, this is your first webinar with us, but I want to add that Dr. Uh, Christina have been here before. She also presented a topic with uh, on our different uh, platform crowdcast, and that was Ask Your Doctor event. So I don't know if you had a pleasure to, to see her in action. If not, I can guarantee that it's going to be an interesting session. I'm sure of it. Uh, so I can only encourage you to type the questions in the chat. Of course, this is all anonymous, so please put those in the chat so that Dr. Christina can answer them for you, and she will do so right after our presentation on the topic. And I think that we can simply go ahead with, with the topic today. Um, and uh, are you ready to begin, Dr. Christina? Yes, yes, we can go ahead. Brilliant. Please. Thank you so much, and uh, let's start our event right now. Okay, so thanks. Thank you for the very kind introduction. So hello everyone from Prague. So I'm going to have a short presentation about fertility preservation and with a focus on egg freezing. So I'm just going to walk you through this topic. So let's say in general, social freezing is the own, is ref, refers to elective retrieval and cryopreservation of both oocyte and sperm when there is no actually medical indication. Cryopreservation of all sites uh, in, gives the women chances to have uh, their own genetic children later on uh, in their life. And we also see a trend of postponing uh, the child, uh, child um, uh, the maternity for to uh, third and fourth decennium. So this goes hand in hand with this uh, kind of uh, trend that we see in population. Uh, when you look at this map, it shows you where social freezing uh, is spread worldwide. You can see that uh, in many places in Europe, but there are some, uh, there are, uh, some exceptions. Social freezing is a common practice as well as in the United States and generally the North America. It's quite popular in Brazil, for example, but you can see that there are some blank spots that uh, indicate the social freezing uh, is not carried uh, out in those countries, for example, Australia. So uh, social freezing has been quite a new method. Uh, it has been widespread with the introduction of so uh, of uh, so-called vitrification, which is uh, the fast freezing of human oocytes, which is uh, which is, enables uh, better uh, uh, survival of the oocyte after the towing process. Uh, vitrification of the oocyte was introduced in uh, 2011 and it's been used since then. So you can see that since 2011, social freezing has raised uh, all over the world. So uh, I would just uh, go uh, start the topic like uh, from the beginning. So uh, let me tell you something about the female fertility. We all know that female fertility is age dependent. That means that the younger the women, the higher the chance for uh, conception. We also know that the fertility and ovarian reserve decreases with age. Uh, the age of 35 is usually used uh, as uh, year, let's say the 
border when we know that since then uh, the unemployedies, which means the abnormal embryo rates, uh, tend to go high. And also uh, when we want to uh, evaluate the, the female fertility, we need to do some tests, for example, the hormonal profile, especially uh, IMH, which, which gives us uh, some idea about uh, the functional capacity of the ovaries and so-called antrophological count uh, that combined with AMH give us the idea how the ovary is going to respond to the stimulation. Uh, the AMH peaks usually about 20 years of age, that's in general, so 25 to 30 is the best time to conceive a child because woman by then has the best capacity of the ovaries, has high uh, MH and should uh, then has, have the, the highest quality of the oocytes. You see that after the age of 35, the MH drops and it starts dropping very steeply uh, after the age of 40. So uh, social freezing in general requires a stimulation of the ovaries that uh, ensure uh, more oocytes are going to mature in within one cycle. We can evaluate the response to the stimulation uh, based on the age, MH and body weight. Those are uh, the main three factors that define and also uh, tells us what kind of stimulation to choose, what uh, dosage of medication to choose for the stimulation in order to obtain the optimal amount of all sites. The retrieval of all sites is done under general anesthesia or under sedation. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes maximum. There are some rare complication, complications linked to this procedure. Uh, the most common one might be the side effects of the stimulation, Usually women complain of mild headaches at uh, the beginning of the stimulation, also some uh, weight, uh, gain, uh, weight gain and uh, the late complication might be the over and hyperstimulation syndrome. Also uh, some rare complications during the anesthesia, which are usually mild and don't require any uh, prolonged observation of the patients, and those are most commonly seen in patients overweight and obese, and also complications linked to uh, the retrieval of the oocytes uh, itself, which uh, the most common one is the bleeding from vaginal, which uh, can be dealt with during the procedure, or very rarely intra-abdominal bleeding that might require uh, the, the, uh, to the referral of the hospital to another uh, like for observation or laparoscopy, but this is very, very rare. It's like one out of a uh, thousand patients. So what is the optimal age for social freezing? I think that's the most common question. Generally, I would say that uh, it's women under 30 years of age. Uh, women between 35 to 38, might profit from social freezing depending on their AMH level. That means that if the AMH is higher, which indicates that more oocytes will be gained during the stimulation, the higher the chances of um, having successful pregnancy in the end. After the 40 years of age, uh, it is still questionable. So uh, what are the general outcomes of uh, the, the frozen and torn all side cycles. Uh, the objective is to have comparable success rates to using fresh all sites, which nowadays I think will be there. Uh, we know that about 95% in our clinic, about 95 to 97% of the all sites will survive the toning process, and the fertilization rates are again like 70 to 80%. Uh, depending on the quality of the semen. So um, what defines the success is mainly the age of woman at the time of the oocyte freezing. So patients also uh, ask us what is the optimal number of oocytes that should be stored. We know that 
the target number should be between 15 to 20 all signs for women younger than 38 years of age. However, once a woman goes over 38 years of age, so in between 38 to 40 years of age, we need 25 to 30 all signs. And once a woman is over 40 years of age, we would need 30 plus, which, uh, as I said in the beginning, once we get older, uh, the ovarian capacity drops. So uh, it sometimes requires multiple stimulation to obtain the sufficient number of oocytes. Uh, when we look at the safety, uh, I mean, look, look into the data when the uh, frozen oocytes have been used uh, and fertilized, we know that there is no high risk of uh, any congenital abnormalities and this overall risk uh, is comparable to women that have conceived naturally or uh, with the standard IVF process. Uh, the risk of fetal loss based uh, or due to aneuploidities may be reduced using uh, young and girl size, which means for example, when you freeze your oocytes at the age of 25 to 30, and then use them after the, uh, uh, the age of 35, you still have the same risk and low risk of aneuploidities uh, linked to the age of um, when the oocytes uh, were frozen. Uh, when you look at the uh, perinatological outcomes, which means uh, how the, the kids are born. There is no difference between uh, children uh, that were conceived using frozen oocytes or uh, that were conceived uh, normally, spontaneously. There is no obstetric or perinatal risk linked to oocyte feeding. Uh, one of the uh, like interesting topics is the actual use it, use, use it rate of frozen oocytes. We know that only about 15 to 20 percent of women actually come back to use their oocytes. Uh, there are multiple reasons to do that, um, depending on the countries, they can, depending on specific legislation. For example, if the woman is still sing single, in some countries she cannot use she cannot use uh, 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 semen with from a donor to fertilize her own eggs and etc. So, and some of the women, of course, get uh, pregnant naturally over the time. Uh, at the moment, uh, in Czech Republic, uh, we store the oocytes for uh, eight years, and but uh, most likely the storage will be unlimited because the medium that we use for freezing doesn't wear out over the years. But uh, we just using the current literature data, so it keeps on changing every year uh, since new data is published on this topic. There's also some ethical points to social freezing. Uh, on one hand, social freezing gives women more reproductive autonomy and uh, enables us to uh, decide when we want to get pregnant and uh, we still at advanced age uh, uh, are able to use our own genetic gametes. On the other hand, uh, one of the downsides of social freezing is that uh, it might promote uh, late maternity. Uh, it might give some uh, false ideas about uh, delaying the time for pregnancy and also we should avoid uh, the, the commercialization of, of this topic in, in medicine. Uh, we can also uh, preserve the embryos. This has been widely used for, for decades in IVF. Uh, but you should bear in mind that the embryo belongs to the couple, which means that if you do have a partner, you create the embryo and freeze it, then, for example, break up with the partner, you would need to have his 
approval with uh, the current under transfer. So, uh, and also uh, there are some other ethical questions linked to cryopreserving embryos because um, it, it depends how the way how you look at the embryo, how you perceive the embryo, if it's a living thing, baby or a tissue. So some people are not willing to discard the embryos. They might be donated in some countries. So there are lots of lots of uh, like uh, ethical questions linked to that. Sorry. Okay. So a few comments on the delayed motherhood, uh, which is also quite a hot topic nowadays. We know that the optimal age for, to have uh, to become pregnant is up to thirty five years of age. That's a biology. Uh, that's something that we cannot overcome with uh, with the med medical advancement at the moment. Uh, the data show us that the advanced uh, maternal age is linked to elevated risk of pregnancy related complications such as diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, and preterm delivery, and even higher rates of uh, miscarriage in the first trimester. So just to conclude, neocide care preservation on one hand offers women the chance to have their own genetic children later in their life, which might lead to reduction of uh, anxiety, especially in some difficult social situation. However, the optimal age to store your eggs is before 35 years of age, with the target number of eggs being uh, 15 to 20. Also, patient overall should be counseled regarding the risk of delayed motherhood and also about family planning in general. So thank you. And I think we, we are ready to start with the questions. Definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Piscina, for your presentation and walking us through all the steps, of course. Um, and of course, now it will be time for your questions. There are some questions here, but of course, I can only encourage you if you have some more, you can definitely type them, type them and uh, Dr. Piscina will definitely uh, answer them for you. Uh, this, as you can see, there are some questions here, some quite interesting questions mm -hmm. I would say as well. Uh, let me start with the two first questions three questions from Emma really, but uh, let me just go uh, here. So she is 42. Uh, is it possible and worth to freeze eggs when you are over 40? So she's 42. And did you ever have had a patient who was her age or older perhaps? We do have lots of requests of women after 40 years of age. And we, also, we always try to evaluate and to see what is like the realistic expectations because as i said we know that we need 25 30 plus x which is something that when you're over 40 cannot be achieved with two three stimulations for that you would most likely need five or six so that's quite a lot load mm. for the body uh also the why the reason why you need so many eggs is that most of the eggs will carry some chromosomal issue with them already so this is to guarantee let's say 60 70 percent chances of having a live birth so even with 30 eggs you don't have 100 percent uh, likelihood of having a healthy child in the end so it's quite a lot to take for both financially and also for the body. So if I can imagine if it was a, a PCOS like women with a high MH right. and we would have a chance to obtain uh, this target number of X within let's say three stimulation cycles, then we would most likely go ahead with that. Mm, okay. Thank you. And uh, there's an interesting uh, follow up here from Emma actually as well. So I have read that survival rate of frozen embryos is higher than frozen eggs. I am single now and wonder if I should fertilize some of my eggs with donor sperm and freeze the rest in case I have a partner. What do you think about such an option? Do, does it happen as well? Yeah, well this um, is the, yeah. uh, it, 
this wouldn't happen in Czech Republic because we don't treat single women. So Emma must come from a different country with a different legislation. So you always have to look at the whole case in uh, also, let's say, in in the framework of, of the local legislations, the, the country legislation. I would just say that at the moment, the survival rate of eggs and embryos is the same. Because once, again, speaking of our lab, but we do freeze eggs quite often. Mm-hmm. And with the use and widespread of vitrification, it's, it's equal. So uh, if she was my client, then I would only have a chance to freeze the egg, of, mm-hmm. eggs, of course. And uh, there wouldn't be the chance to, or, or the option of, of fertilizing the eggs with uh, with a donor sperm. But that's that's the law, of course. So this is not possible, of course, here in in the Czech Republic, right? Um, so basically, uh, just to make everyone, um, you know, realize that in such case, like um, freezing eggs is possible if if you are single, of course, that's not a problem. But as here, if you are single and would like to try with sperm donor as well, uh, just to have embryos, it's impossible to do, right? Just to clarify yes, to yes. everyone. Hmm? Okay, this is important, obviously, as you said, um, there are different countries, different laws, so we always need to check that first. <laughs> first thing we need to do is uh, to check that. Um, all right, let me, oh, okay, and one more question also from Emma, I will ask this here. So what stimulation technique is used for egg freezing? It's the same stimulation as for the IVF. Again, we try to pick the best uh, medication, the best protocol suited to the patient. It's, it's basically tailor-made for, for each patient. So that's no no general answer to that. Oh, okay. Of course, you need to find the yeah, best. But mainly it's gonadotropins. Uh, so it means the injections for about 10 to 14 days, followed by the oocyte retrieval. Yes, clear, of course. I will go back to this uh, longer question, but as you can see, one more question is, can you freeze egg for a 40-year-old and over? We already mentioned this, but if you can shortly yes, sum up. Covered that. Yes, yeah, if, uh, it's really individual and this has to be judged by the ultrasound, the AMH, the hormonal profile, but overall, as I said, we need 30 eggs at least. Mm-hmm. Exactly. This is the the point. You, you need lots of eggs. Yeah. That means lots of stimulation will need to happen in order to to have that exactly. to get that. So this is uh, yeah. usually the uh, the, the, the issue here. Yeah. This is one of the reasons. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why IVF over forty becomes difficult because the ovarian capacity drops and you need more eggs to have one good quality embryo. Uh, yeah, no problem at all. That's why I wanted to repeat that. I know this is quite a, a question yeah, yeah, that will yeah. pop up. So, of course, uh, no problem, Edith. Thank you so much for joining even later. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. And now we will go to the question I mentioned, uh, the previous one. Why do you need to have sedation and anesthesia for egg retrieval as opposed to being awake with local anesthesia? What would be the process if you have a fibroid in the way of an ovary? And how would you get the eggs? Do you need to be sedated for that? Well, we do use the sedation or general anesthesia because the retrieval itself is painful, especially when you have multiple follicles. And the pain is spread through the peritoneum, which is a membrane that sort of covers the whole abdomen. And that's something that cannot uh, be anesthetized locally. So there's no, uh, usually no option to use the local anesthesia for the retrieval. So that's one part of the uh, answering the question. The other one, if you have a fibroid, um, in most of the cases, you're able to, let's say, move the ovaries around. It's most likely the case because the ovaries don't usually, unless you have like some adhesions that uh, sort of bind the ovary to the uterus. But uh, when, once you have stimulated the ovaries, they tend to drop down uh, inside the pelvis. So in most of the cases, the ovaries are reachable. 
We can also do transabdominal puncture if the ovaries are high up and are not accessible to standard vaginal weight. So that's one of the options as well. And uh, or we can just do the puncture through the fiber. That's also technically possible. Okay. That makes sense again. Thank you. Um, if you have any more follow-ups, I believe it was um, or answered thoroughly. And um, if there's anything you wish to add, of course, go ahead, type this in. There's one more question, so I can only encourage you to ask some more if you have. Um, okay, and one more follow-up actually we did uh, receive. So in, is puncture through fiber really painful? Yes, it is. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. So this is the reason. Yeah, obviously. It's, it, yeah, it's it's a sort of a muscle tissue. It's the same thing. So yes, you have to pass the needle through, and it would be quite painful. For the oh, it's better not to. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes, and believe me, I had the patient that was. I don't know why afraid of uh, undergoing general anesthesia. And she had like 50 follicles. She she made it without the anesthesia, but it was the most uncomfortable procedure mm -hmm. for both of us, I would say. So, yeah. Right. That makes sense. I think that explains it. So thank you for your follow up. But yeah, when it comes to me, you convinced me in such case. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> something that is better to be if it's yeah, it's it's just easier for for both patient and the doctor in this case as well, right? All right, thank you uh, for the clarification. I think it's it's pretty uh, much clear. Um, this question here, does freezing egg affect the DNA as opposed to fresh eggs? Well, uh, the, the fast freezing, the vitrification shouldn't. Uh, however, uh, egg is the, the biggest cell in our body and has, it has quite a lot of water. So uh, that's why the slow freezing, the, the method that has been uh, used before vitrification didn't work well for freezing the eggs and that's why it wasn't used so often. So with the introduction of fast freezing, uh, the quality of the eggs and which we see on the, um, let's say the pregnancy and the, uh, the obstetrical outcomes uh, should be the same, the quality of the DNA. So we don't, as, as I mentioned, we don't have higher rates of abnormalities, which is always the concern of mm -hmm. having a new method introduced. And of course. So there's nowadays no difference here. So you can uh, yeah. you can be sure that it's a, it's a safe procedure for sure as well, right? Okay, I don't see more questions. So of course, if you have any anything else, we are still here. We are uh, happy. We'll be happy to help you out. But of course, if not, that's perfectly okay. Uh, I know that you, you always can uh, ask the questions directly to uh, Dr. Christina, her team at Ginem, and I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you out with any questions you may have. Um, and of course, we will be back with some more events. Uh, with Dr. Christina, but also we will be back with some other topics. As you know, we have another webinar also next week. I will talk about it in a minute, but yeah, I think there is another thank you here. Someone is typing, I want to make sure, but it looks like we have answered all of your questions. Uh, so thanks everyone for your time, for your questions. Uh, Dr. Christina, it was great to have you. Any final words before we finish for today? Well, I would just like to sum it up uh, that social freezing is definitely a good tool, but we have to keep in our minds that there is some age limits to that. And uh, if you're considering then doing social freezing before the age of 35 is the best. From my point of view, between 30 to 35 is the ideal because before that, if you do it too early, then most likely you're not going to use your ex at all because you will find a partner on the way you'll get pregnant so it's usually those you know between 30 to 35 when you're deciding about uh, whether you have the right partner to uh, start a family or not and when you start getting anxious about your about your future fertility so that I should think should be the general awareness of 
the social freezing and the take home message. True. Yeah. So it's something that you shouldn't do too early and too uh, too late, right? Of course. So before, like, it's best exactly. to do that up to. 35, but too early might not be a great idea as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that we are discussing this topic. This is something that we should discuss for sure and educate young women as well. Um, and anyone who is thinking, who is not even thinking about it, but maybe this is something that we should spread awareness. And that's why we are talking about this today. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Christina, also for yes. um, you, presenting. As you can see, it was a pleasure. Uh, quality of presentation is very good and clear. Couldn't agree more. Um, and I think it was really, um, yeah, that's what I, I just read in the comments. I wish I was told earlier about a freezing and that's true. And this is the aim as well for us, but obviously um, this is what we want to do. And I still think that it's still not talked about enough and many young women are not even aware of that. That's the reality. Right? Yes, yes. So. But I think it's, it's been changing and it's, we have to be honest, it's a new method. Mm, right? sure. So it, it, it hasn't been on the market for too long. So, and mm. when something is new, Glad it's changing though, right? way mm. to see how it, yeah, how it goes and. So, yeah, I think it will change over the years, but I think that uh, we shouldn't really postpone the time of having children. Sometimes it's not about ourselves as well. It's like the combination of, say, the social um, economy and things like that and not having the right partner. So it's not uh, a decision that uh, is easy to make, but we have to know that our bodies have some limits and some biological limits as well. So it's not about, only about the age of the eggs. It's also about the uterus and ha having uh, in mind our well-being and the well-being of the child. I don't agree more here. <laughs> so thank you so much for okay, this summary so as well. Thank you. Have a great um, evening, everyone. Dr. Christina, it was lovely to have you. And I'm looking forward to some more events with you. There are some more events coming up with Dr. Christina as well. And we will be back um, next Tuesday as we will discuss more topics. So thanks, everyone, for your time as always. It's been great to have you. And one more thing before we finish, as always, you will be redirected to our survey. So if you found this webinar and all of our webinars useful, just it will take you one minute and 30 seconds. So please fill it in. Let us know what you think. What Let us know what you would like us to discuss, what kind of topics and where are you at at your uh, current uh, IVF journey. We would love to hear from you. And I can only encourage you to, to just fill in our survey. Thank you. Have a lovely evening as Thank always and see you soon. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.